So you're about to be listening to the sultry, tender voices of Team Cobb, as we've been known for a while, which consists of me, Kevin Cornelio, and... Boy, Rob Hardison. Welcome to the journey with us. It might be a bumpy ride, but I promise we'll get you there smoothly in the end. Don't listen to this dude, we good. (laughs) So settle in, sit back and relax, and enjoy the show. All right, I think this will be an interesting conversation from our different perspectives, with the topic being sales. So I have uh, a lot of different experience with the sales process than you. I'm curious what comes to mind when you think of sales. So, well, top of the sales is, is basically like the field of, of, of compliance, I'll call it, like where you are trying to get someone to comply with, with, and, and with your product, for example, like if you're trying to get them to purchase something, you're trying to get them to comply with it, and you're basically influencing them in a way that is, ideally, if you're doing it, in my opinion, if you're doing it right, if it's within their best interest, uh, that, you know, if you're doing it the most effective way, it's, it's, ideally, yeah. it's in their best interest, but um, the concept behind sales is not really concerned with that, it's really just, well, how do I get this person to do what I want them to do, which in sales cases, yeah, and I like the use of the word compliance there that you put into it because it immediately makes my brain go, which my brain is often looking to go, um, more big picture and uh, kind of philosophical or conceptual with it. But thinking about it in terms of compliance, um, compliance has a lot of other connotations to it beyond just a, a transaction of a product or service to me. Where, like, yeah, if you think about complying, the way you you fit in the definition, it it certainly is appropriate for sales, but complying to anything, it's like you're looking for someone to comply as in to see a value that you're seeing or describing. Exactly. You're looking to influence influence someone's point of view with the end result being that they will take an action in accordance with what you're, with with what you're, uh, Whatever you're proposing. Yeah, exactly. Whatever, yeah. whatever you're proposing. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm sure there's actually, in the book you mentioned, that you've uh, been reading Influence. There's probably a lot that ties in here. Definitely. Um, the, the author talks about a lot, of, a lot of different tactics you can employ based on psychological uh, um, uh, paradigms that you can take advantage of uh, where that these psychological things... They're, they're almost automatic in us. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, one's called social proof. You know, if you're in a group of people and the group does something, uh, uh, the group will do something interesting, which is they'll kind of look at each other's feedback. Mm-hmm. So if one person does something, you know, they may not have any merit to what they're doing at all, but because that person did it and they're in a group, in a group setting, the other people viewing that thing they, they may start to do it themselves. Mm. A, a it, good it's example, acting off of social cues, essentially. Exactly. A good example of this, like they, they did a study to kind of test this, this theory of social proof, where uh, they, they set up an office, right? And what they did was they had 10 people come into that office. Nine of them, though, were in on the, in on the experiment. Mm. Nine of the initial 10 were in on the experiment. There was one person that was not part of it. And what happened was... What these nine people would do is every time a bell would ring, they would all just stand up for no reason other than that bell ring. And so the people looking on... See where this is going. Yeah. The, pe- the person looking on at first would kind of like... Be like, what the hell? Like the you know, posted response to gauges. Yeah. Like, that they're doesn't like, make they're, sense. They're curious and they're watching the other people. But like after... Most people after the second... First or second one, they were already do, um, participating. They had no idea why, but they're just doing it. Yeah. Right. And um, like pretty much everyone did it. It was, it was almost it was it was extremely rare for someone mm-hmm. not to do it. So going beyond that, what they did was so 
basically it was a doctor's office. Each person, uh, uh, each of the nine people would be called to the doctor's office. But then a new person, and this new person was also new to the environment, uh, did not know the, the experiment. This new person did not know, and, and sure enough, they would comply as well. They would come in, they'd stand up when the bell rang, and no idea why, usually it took like two or three times, but they would, they would sure enough stand up. Now, fast forward to towards the end of the experiment. Now, everyone in that room is, is, is not a part of the experiment, but everyone in that room is now standing up when the bells, when they've been conditioned to stand up when that yeah. bell is. They have no fucking idea why, but they're still doing it. It's, it's like, you know, taking Pavlov's dog and placing it then into the, the human context and the human environment. And we're all just animals at the end of the day because we conditioning, certainly are. conditioning works no matter what. It's just, you know, we, we try to outthink it sometimes or think we're smarter than you know, being an animal. It's just when you're, when your awareness isn't at the level that, you know, it, the human brain is capable of putting it to, but not always functioning at, we're just animals at that point as much as any, any other. Agreed. Uh, the book um, refers to it as, as like a computer system, and, and like they, they use the term click word as in like a, a tape running. What was it? Click word. But, and they like use word. that sound. Of all the time oh, running, so it's a, I don't know if the word. Yeah, exactly. Um, they use this. They use that term of, of, of click word, as in there's a script that we all kind of uh, is inherent in our behavior, mm-hmm. similar to that of any other animal. We are a specific type of animal, for sure. Yeah. We may not be class. We may have a, a different classification, sure. but we do have those automatic responses to scenarios. And mm-hmm. if you don't have awareness to, you can't. You you have no choice. Whether they're good for you or not, and sometimes they're not so good. Mm-hmm. See, I'm curious. Uh, I don't know if you have an example off the top of your head, but when you say not so good, I'm curious if there is anything that you had in mind there of a scenario where that is to so, the fact that you're essentially taking action against your own yeah. well-being. Well, I want to first give an example outside of the human context, and then tie it into the human context to kind of like paint the picture fully so that people have the idea of what this thing is actually is. And it's very similar in us. It's, but, um, for example, there's there's a species of, of, of bird that, I think it's a turkey, but um, anyway, there's a species of bird that, that what the, they they will play their quick war, their automatic behavior of, of, of mothering their, their young if they hear a, a specific uh, uh, Twerp for them. To, um, what's the word? Um, chirp. Chirp from them. They'll they'll start mothering that 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 baby only if they hear that 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 chirp. That chirp chirp sound initiates that click word, that automatic behavior. Now, what's interesting is if uh, if you put a doll of of, of a, one of their predators, it's like this um, type of uh, type of uh, cat. Like a large, uh, uh, large cat. Um, if you put a doll of that cat, which you would think that the, uh, any replica of that of a predator would trigger some type of fear response. Now, initially it does, but what happens is if they start playing that that chirp chirp, they'll mother that that doll. It's 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 really interesting. It overtakes the visual. Yes, they're filtering, but it's it's basically just describing the fact that they're filtering based on a. A very simple thing that works 95% of the time, that chirp chirp. And in, 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 in a natural environment, there's you, you won't have that simulated chirp chirp. But I say that to say this, we also filter based on very simplistic means that, that work for us a lot of the times, but will fail sometimes. Like there's um, a tactic that sales, sales people perform of... Um, um, that, that they take advantage of what's called the anchoring bias, where they will first initiate initiate uh, uh, they'll initiate dialogue with a product being a certain price. Let's say a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Now they're gonna they're gonna tell you though that. This price, this price is normally hundred dollars. Really, they're bullshitting that there, but they're anchoring that price of hundred dollars in your mind. So you're like, ah, hundred dollars, I don't want to do. I'm not gonna necessarily do hundred dollars. Hundred dollars is the price, but you're anchoring that value of hundred to that 
specific product. Then when we see that they're, they're willing to, to kind of retreat from that and, and give us a lower price, what that triggers a certain instinct in us to be like, well, they're, they're giving me a deal here, so let me go ahead and take advantage of this deal, where really there's no deal to be had there, but they triggered a specific pattern of thinking in us that makes us want to then buy that product. Yeah, well, well put. And I, I mean, personally, with my experience now at this point in my life in the sales process and the consumption process, so to speak, I mean, it's all points on the spectrum, but being heavily experienced in consumption and heavily experienced in the offering side, the sales side of things, um, kind of knowing that spectrum as I do, I have a much different, I guess, feeling towards sales, if you want to call it that, or just a, an approach to the whole process um, than I once did, for sure. And I kind of do... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious. What, what, like, let me pose a question for to you, mm-hmm. being a someone who works in sales. Let me pose that question to you. Like, like, what's your view or your philosophy on on, on, of, on sales? What comes to mind when you hear that term and what goes that thought process? Yeah, well, I have um uh, very much at this point a a thought that ties in with emotion. I'll say um, that I'm still working on. Uh, harnessing in some ways, but uh, with sales, even when you put the term out there, working sales, I actually have like a bullshit response to some of my mind of, I think I've chosen at this point not to work in sales very adamantly. Mm-hmm. And that being the case, um, when that first started for me, uh, which wasn't too long ago, uh, that decision of not, not wanting to and not deciding to work in sales, I realized more and more how we all live in sales. So I would classify it that way of myself, for myself now is just the distinction of not that I work in sales anymore, but I live in the sales environment that we all live in is how I would say it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Cause like when you're talking about a lot of these things, like they have a certain connotation to them that, that I think what you initially pointed to is that you kind of want to, you kind of want to shy away from it because it seems somewhat, uh, uh nefarious mm-hmm. but then when you realize it's 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 an expression it's like it's it's the water we swim in mm-hmm. it, you know it, it, it's you can't really escape it mm-hmm. and it's it's not good or bad it's just a thing that happens mm-hmm. so to apply morality there is, is probably incorrect so you know you, you can look at it as as it is or you can kind of create this fairy tale of how it could be which is usually not in your best interest sure and to, um, because I, I tend to, you know, speak a little generally, I, I will, although I know you understood where I was coming from with that, I will more point, uh, pointedly answer your question of how I view sales is uh, as a, a form of communication, really. Yep. And I would say, to put a finer point on that, um, just a more consciously, I don't want to use the word contrived because of the connotation, but just a more consciously um, I'll say communicating toward a result with a more aware effort to communicate to an end of means, so to speak, to a to an end of um, you know transaction. Yeah, I definitely support the I definitely think that definition works. It is, is, is accurate where you're not simply communicating information you're communicating in a way that is, is attempting to get compliance but, um, you know it's a point yeah, it, 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 like a leaded a leading form of communication like consciously done yeah I personally don't have have a uh, have any quarrel with, with signing certain words um, like some, such as contrived. I think that's a, a very useful word there. It's very precise. Yeah. Outside the connotation, which again yeah, is sort of a around, very objective so. understanding of the word, which obviously I'm aware of and wasn't putting the caveat for your purposes, but yeah. contrived really does fit, just meaning that you're you're basically um, you know, again, the, the connotation comes up, but like manipulating a situation 
to an end. It's not just a mindless effort, I would say, is the comparison there, the contrast. Yeah, there's a preconceived notion there. You, you have a you you have a, a particular goal in mind. And it's funny, because I do think all the words that come to mind with this do have a negative connotation. Like, I even thought to say premeditated uh, when you said preconceived. Like, it, it's true. It's, it's premeditated behavior, premeditated uh, interaction, and I think a lot of people have a negative connotation of that. But it really just means you, you thought about it ahead of time. Yeah, and, but see, the thing, the thing that, I, that, I, that I look at is for both the buyer, the buyer and the seller, I think it serves them both to both be aware of the realm that we're playing in, mm-hmm. the game that's being played, which is, you know, we're even on a subconscious level, without being aware of it, we're all trying to sell each other on, on ourselves. Well said, yeah. You know, all the that's time. True. So it's like if you once you once you become aware of that game, it's like yeah. you should have the awareness to not be mindlessly manipulated. Yeah, and I think this is where we get to the point of the conversation where we've been leading toward this track just naturally in our thought processes. We kind of open the can of worms here of anyone who might be listening to this thinking, wait, when you say we're selling each other all the time. So this is what you're referring to when you say, like, the waters we all swim in, which I like the phrasing. This is life. Like, sales is in everything we do. Even you and I right now, at a certain level, to a certain extent, are kind of selling ideas back and forth. And when there's it right there, like, you buy that idea and you, you know, Post on the back or just wait for the next sale, so to speak. It's like it's a very transactional and, and meticulous way to to deconstruct communication and language and life. Obviously, we're we're really uh, putting things under a microscope here, but um, at the same time, it, it's helpful to understand this to a certain level. Sometimes it you know, can drive you crazy, of course, but um, it's just something that again raises awareness to really anything like you can apply it anywhere in your life where there's uh just a opportunity or a desire for more knowledge or understanding of something if you look at it and again sales is just a framework like i said comparing yeah. to communication you could say i mean i've said this too not to go off on a tangent with this right now but i've said that um like exchange of money or any currency is another form of communication to me Definitely, and um, that that whole idea of, of exchanging value is uh, definitely a topic for another conversation that we should, we should definitely talk about. The book *Sapiens* I'm reading is uh, talks about like where money first originated mm-hmm. and how you know initially it was it was hard for people to exchange value mm-hmm. in any real way. You know, like right. where like maybe I may choose and I wanted. Apples. Yeah, like the barter system, uh, yeah, exactly. which, which is at the core of my, you know, passion, as, as you know a little bit, and, um, you know, it, I might say a platform if I ever were in for anything, which I don't think I will, but maybe I kind of am absentmindedly right now. Uh, I, think, like, I think it's a valuable idea to rethink how we how we engage with exchanging value. The, the monetary system we have now is somewhat somewhat outdated, I, I, um, it seems like. I think it's just overinflated. Yeah, way. exactly. Like I think people put too much. Like it seems like people are, like I once told someone that 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 money is not real. It's imaginary, yeah. and they didn't believe me. They people they got hate the concept. Yeah, they, um, they didn't believe me. They, they they were this piece of paper. Me in their mind was mm-hmm. like is is a tangible thing that that is is valuable. But like if you give a monkey Talk a piece of paper, yeah. yeah, if you give a monkey a piece of paper, he's like. What do you think of this yeah. is? I'm not human. I wouldn't take that stupid shit. Yeah, and this is where I think it gets to the fun conversations of, like, even, you know, uh, an example of a story, and I won't go into specifics and get lost in the details, but stories where they talk about, and we've talked about, like, other animals being actually more intelligent than human beings, and we're the ones sometimes looked at as an ex- in an experiment, like, yeah, it, you know. It speaks to, it speaks to, um, it speaks to what we were speaking to before in terms of how we're kind of conditioned to behave a certain way. Money is, is a very good example where, where where we no longer are in touch with why we're using money. We just think money is this end-all, be-all thing. It's one of our biggest triggers to a preconditioned response. Yeah, and if when you really think about it, money gets money itself is has a zero value other than our shared imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of a sudden. And 
that's partially why, you know, I, in my description before, refer to it as a form of communication. It's it's a very effective, and uh, yeah, not to take too much away from money, although oh, I have I true. have my own preferences and biases against it, quote unquote, in some ways. I mean, there's obvious necessity and benefit to it of being just a very common language. Well, it's, it's, it, it, if you're looking at the history of, of, of humanity, right, and um, the, the one thing you could say about money is it's the most pervasive and powerful story of all time. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a, a system of trust and value mm-hmm. that everyone believes in. Yeah. Like other other like very powerful um, systems of, of, of stories, like religion it comes to mind here, where religion uh, there's uh, there's other mm-hmm. there's other groupings of ideas that are pervasive, but money is the one thing that everyone believes in. That's intriguing me now where I'm like, I have a tendency to want to compare and rank. And I'm like, all right, well, now is it number one? Like, if we did a, if we did a ranking. Try it. Try, let's try it. it. Okay, let's do it. What do you what, think about it? If you, if you stop and think about it, no matter where I'll you go. I'll come to mind. And, and now, so I don't necessarily mean just like the American version of it. I mean, everywhere you go, every human culture, and right. this is throughout time, yeah. uses some form of of, of currency, currency mm-hmm. for exchanging uh, goods and services. Mm-hmm. So, okay, you, you kind of set up a nice uh, launching pad for me to go to really explore this, which is if you go back through time, like what predates currency? So, I mean, I'm thinking at a very fundamental level here. You, you might have a... Uh, no, I also want to have the caveat, right. because I think you're going here, you're going to this spot here, okay. which, which in essence is, is really the crux of the issue is when you try to scale the system of, of bartering. Mm-hmm. Um, because bartering works when you're in, like, if it's just small me groups, and you yeah. in small groups. Yep. And, um, uh, if it's you just and like, I do this in practice often. Exactly. Um, but, like, today. When, you, when you scale that system... Mm-hmm. Like, well, my friend Simon Sinek often says, uh, scale breaks things. Yeah, when you scale that system to large groups of people, it just doesn't work. You know, like, let's say me and you, like... You make apples. Mm-hmm. I love apples. So my yep. shoes that I make, I can give to you. Yep. You give me apples because you love shoes and yep. I love apples. Yep. You know, that works. And then you had a third person and he's allergic to apples and the whole system breaks down. Exactly. So now we have to figure out a way to exchange between all of us and, and then extrapolate that out to anybody else who's who's coming into that group. So I'm reminded quickly of a good one. Too. It's a oh, so. With at the apples. Oh, oh <laughs> the... Uh, you like apples? Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like apples? Other than that dumbass Michael Bowen books. Yeah, right. I mean, he actually said yes, so even he likes apples. But, all right, not to get too off topic. Um, yeah, so I actually wasn't going to go with the barter system on this one. So you made a good point, and it is part of an argument I might make uh, at certain points. But I was going to go, actually, I'm going to see what you say with this. I mean, maybe it's something for you to grapple with. I was going to say sex. Post money. So, I, I like where you're going with this, and I'm trying to, um, like, but sex is, I wouldn't classify in the same way, although I, I agree with you. Like, that is one of the biggest human motivations, but um, I was specifically referring to, like, the, like something that is, is, is in the mind only. Like, it, 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 it's sex is valuable to people. Sex is value. Like mm-hmm. that provides people value. Yeah. Money does not. So like, it, it's it's a fake system of beliefs. I mean, it's a system of beliefs. I won't call it fake because well, it's, it's, it has its, it's but it's it's a intangible piece of our imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there are distinct things, and it probably makes sense to separate them in this conversation. Yeah, um, but what you're describing is 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 definitely 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 valuable, but it's like. You can almost, well, money, money kind of is a abstraction of that. Right. It's, it's not a, it, it, and, and that's what I'm, re- okay, I'll, I'll refer to it as money being the most pervasive abstraction, meaning like other creatures don't well, use it. And you said it well before, I mean, it is imagined, so to speak, in that we create the value for it that's not fundamentally in there. Exactly. So if you want to, yeah, so, okay, I scaled it as probably, fundamentals against. Um, yeah. 
so and you, you touched that on something that's that extremely issue. valuable, right. but like fundamentally, it, it is valuable. There's no right, right. abstraction about it. Is, it. it is probably what is the, the, the maybe the value or part of the core value that you want to say, like in terms of primary colors, right? You have the, the few primary things that everything exactly. else that is built off of. That's probably most what money points to. I would say. Yeah, it's like the, the extrapolation out of that is it, it's talk about like sources of lust or whatever you want to call it. Um, is there any greater lust in this world other than sex for money? Like, is that might be number two in terms of like the lust tier? Maybe, maybe it's apparent to money so, is sex. Well, so well, well, I think what happened is money became this thing. It's, it's an abstraction, it's an abstraction of sorts. Like, I'm going to liken it to programming. Pro- and programming, what happened over time is it used to be zeros and ones. But what happened is people didn't want to do the work of, of writing zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. You know, so what they did was they created a programming yeah, language that <laughs> I had to analyze this in, in uh, post-production to make sure I, I got that right. But, um, what they did was they created a language that, that, that abstracted from that and built upon and, and, and coalesced that into something that was 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 encapsulated in something more easily used. Like tangible, right? Yeah. And, and it still works, but it's not it's it's, it's an abstraction from that base level. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's what programming languages do. They 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 are more human readable but they are really what they are is an abstraction from that machine language that is the fundamental thing. Mm-hmm. Like now, another fundamental thing is is is, is food. Well, yeah. But like again, those are there. It's a, I, I put that in a different category because it, it's it's really what money's right. representing. And to be honest, let me just pause you there because I think you got to a point that I misspoke on a little bit. Is probably if we were going to point to something, I think money would point more to the the food and resources in terms of its direct parent rather than sex um well sex is sex is a very fundamental human motivation oh, of course i just meant if they're ever tying a correlation there a track i don't know if you're following well, this I, no i am but, like, making this point, um, but. but sex is almost like some especially males males will opt to have sex over get over eat it mm-hmm. it's a powerful powerful motiva- motivating factor I want to do something with that, but I don't even know yet. A lot of, a lot of actually, a lot of male species actually will, will sacrifice their own lives in order, in order to have sex. Please give me some, uh, some backing to that, like. Like, well, so, um, so a lot of, for example, um, spiders come to mind here. Mm. Um, there's, there's several species of spiders that will, and uh, that, that, that the uh, after he's done copulating, the female eats him. Mm. Might say that's true in humans too, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm brought back to um, kind of a question. I think that connects with something earlier, of like how consciously aware is that spider of what the result is going to be after he. You know? Well, so I, I think you make a good point, but I also think that the urge is so strong that he it doesn't, doesn't matter. give a fuck. <laughs> like, well, you know. it's it's you know it's it's possible. I, I just don't know that that could be proven. I, I, mean, I, I, well, I don't. You, you kind of know he knows because he's very cautious. Like, he's doing this, he's, he's, he does this dance, and, like, he has to know precisely right, otherwise he won't even get the chance to travel it. She'll just massacre him on the spot. This, the, 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 um, I, I watched a, a video on this, too, where um, where I watched fail, failed attempts and successful attempts. I'm, I'm, I really, it was already in my mind, but now i got to ask the question, like, how much spider sex have you watched in your life? Well, that's my preferred method of watching porn. That's what I jerk off to. <laughs> Talk about opening a can of worms. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I've actually had a, a fear of spiders that, in order to get over it, I kind of exposed myself to like large uh, spiders. That, that makes was, that makes sense to me that you would do that. <laughs> yeah. So I, what I did what I did was I'd watch videos of large spiders, which like well, it still kind of gets to me. Sure. But now I can I can I can. Yeah, you're removing some of the you know, desensitizing concern. Isn't it? I mean that's yeah. Now you're talking about my psychology heartstrings. Of, uh, that's, I mean, therapy is based on that, or, uh, or phobias, and, you know, not sure what, what level your fear is, was actually at, obviously it wasn't a, you know, debilitating phobia, but people who do have phobias, they, they want to get over, or that are, you know, to 
whatever extent. That's how you do it. You know, a method of desensitization would be yeah, staring at the thing you're afraid of until you don't feel that level of fear. Yeah, and uh, something I, something I learned in basic. And it's really a part in this step by step process, but whatever. Well, so for me, I don't even let it be a step-by-step process anymore. Like, if something scares me, I'm going to fight it right away. I'm not going to let myself psych myself. I'm not going to let, because the, that fear response comes in, in, in that time between action and, and, and perception and action. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if, if you give yourself time to, to allow that to creep in, mm-hmm. it will. And it'll grow. And it, like, unless exactly. you do something with it. Exactly. Or remove yourself so, from the situation. That's where the fight or flight response have to cultivate that fight response like mm-hmm. go just go fight it sure. just no other option you make that you um, it, I'm, it's easier said than done obviously i'm a soldier too so like that, that's been it takes tradition practice yeah that that it's been conditioned into me from basic training to kind of mm-hmm. to 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 risk to engage the yeah. source of quote-unquote fear in a non-fearful approach Exactly. Like, there's a switch that that, that that military personnel have where when shit's going down, it, like you you it took it takes a while to kind of turn it on and off. But there's a switch. It's like when when we feel feel like shit's about to suck, mm-hmm. you, you have to go into this mode of fuck it. Let's let's just get it done. You know, you yeah. got to go into this fight. This this I'm going to and I'm going to kill you before you kill me. Yeah, it's, it's a very visceral thing. Yeah, well said. And this real tying to the uh, the fundamental, as we mentioned a few times in the, the concept of the podcast, the fundamental imperative, that's where it comes from. It's like fundamental response, so to speak. Yeah. And just to tie this back, is anyone listening to this might think we started with the topic of sales and gotten so far from it, but really we, we haven't because even if you, let's go to that example, as far as we are now ostensibly from the topic of sales if you're looking at something in the situation you just described as uh, you know a threat right okay so um, to your point where you in sales you have to gauge where someone's psychology is you have to gauge what their perspective is so if, if they see things as a threat for example mm-hmm. something that makes them uncomfortable which yes. a proposal of many things in sales is something that poses that triggers that fear response or that discomfort, whatever you want, to, whatever term of feeling you want to tie to it, it's all coming from the same source, basically. Yeah, and what you do as a salesman is you frame the thing that you, the product that you're offering, in a way that alleviates that stress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when we talk about like the impulse buy, for example, that's really what you're doing in a sense is manipulating that impulse by instinct and you condition it in yourself of like instead of buying what this threat is selling me of fear or, yeah. or triggering that fear rather and buying that that thing is going to influence me or dominate me or make me do it at once I'm saying fuck that you're I'm saying a- you're, you're conditioning your own impulse by response of I'm buying what I'm selling instead yeah. of that just automatic reflex of you're giving up power there because that's really and then we're talking about it something that's not quite coming together yet but um just to to fit it more poignantly in the in the frame if you have this example this abstract example of i can kind of tie that in for you i was going to do it anyway but let me try and then you come um this i'll use your your example of um you're encountering let's say a giant spider in the environment right and that spider just upon seeing it, 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 it's communicating to you, however passively, with its presence even, that it's going to cause you harm. And so you, Rob, in that situation you described, have conditioned yourself, um, ideally, and probably in practice, to not allow that fear response to creep in and basically diminish your ability to resist what it's selling. So you, yes. you're so, basically buying in more quickly to what you are selling yourself to overcome the option, basically, of, of buying into just yes. whatever that's so selling let, you. Let me, let me try to tie in here, because what you're saying is actually very precise, but I want to make it clear that I'm not going to try to fight like a bear, for example. Like, I'm not going to, what I'm not going to do... You're accepting what the bear is selling. 
No, not at all. Well, okay. I, I'm, I'm rejecting what the builder bear is selling because what happens in a fair response that people have is that we we freeze up, mm-hmm. we freeze up, and we we don't we respond illogically. We respond sometimes like a common thing that women do is they they yell, which is an evolutionary adaptation, so that they can receive help from from from. Yeah anyone capable in that, yeah. in that case. Yeah. They're attracting the attention of the group so that the group can come yeah, and... cry for help. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little... It's a, Literal. It's a uncontrolled cry for help. Sure. And, but a lot of times what you what you do is is you're kind of poking... You're literally poking the... If, if you start making a lot of noise, that's... It's that's poking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you start making a lot of noise that's threatening to, to that to, to that predator, what, you, what you've then done is, is, is you've... you've Created a situation that's more dangerous for yourself. So, so what I'm doing there with, is I'm rejecting that frame of oh, you should be terrified, your knees should be shaking, you should freeze up. I'm rejecting that frame, and I'm saying, in my case, I'm going to rely on my training uh, to, to to you know what weapons what weapons I'm going to rely on my knowledge and my awareness of of what to of what to do in that situation. I'm going to consider hey this this bear. You beat me head head on, so I'm not gonna try to fight it. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to survive as opposed to trying to uh, to just reacting like without any forethought. I'm gonna Interesting. So I might I might just reframe the description a little bit from before of because based on what you said, it it all lines up really well. And I would just say that to reframe the description of whether you're buying what the bear is selling or not, or what you're selling. I might say now is is you're not necessarily buying what the bear is selling, you're also just not buying what your instincts might be selling you. You're attempting to take a third option there and buy into a training and a more logic-based response that yes. can interject, if it's, not it's, instantly, uh, close enough to immediately yes. that it overtakes or just pushes aside the instinctive fear response yes you're understanding the game that's being played there's there's like you, you're understanding you, you have a, an awareness of your own tendency um because you've been put there and you've seen like uh, there's been countless times where i had reason up frozen up um I, I, when i was young i got to a fight with this kid and and, and he literally beat my teeth in <laughs> my two front teeth are fake because i, I got to a fight I got knocked they got knocked out and but i froze and I was really young, and I didn't know any better. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's other examples as well, like where um, even when I was wrestling and, and doing martial arts and things like that, where where there been instances where I I got pummeled because I because I let my instincts, my yeah. natural react instincts, and respond. I didn't react. And and what I had to learn, no, I didn't respond intuitively. I didn't know any options other than to just freeze up. And, and that's the native state is that you don't. If, until you start to learn how to, you know, you, you learn what's going on, you're going to accept whatever. You're just going to be right. manipulated. Until you learn how to combat that manipulation, which is, again, it, this ties well into the, the realm of sales yeah. because well, there's yeah, a constant it's not push and pull. a threat to your life, but it's a threat to whatever your interest. situation. Yeah, your interest is a good way to put it. Um, when you talk about manipulation there, it's manipulation, influence, all these terms are pointing to a similar concept, whether you're putting it in the, the construct of, you know, our basic environment of facing a bear or a spider, or the more modern environment um, of facing, you know, a telemarketer. Yeah, and, and... They're offering you something that in, interrupts your process, so to speak, and might be something you don't want. Precisely. Now, uh, there's a... There's a a line from a book that I like, um, I think it's called The Barbarian, or um, A More Complete Beast. Anyway, the line goes like this. It's, it's whose, whose will are you following? Mm-hmm. Like, are you following your own? Are you following someone else's? Do you even know? Like, do you know I what, like, like, what you're, what? It's, I love that it poses the question, you know, means yeah. the question. Do you even know what, whose, whose interests are you satisfying? Do you even know? Like, mm-hmm. seriously, think about that. Mm-hmm. Whose interests? And I don't think a lot of us do think about that because well, it's, I think you know, that triggers the fear response for a lot of people. Is 
like that level of thought or that's a challenging question. It's a very challenging Yeah, we've built society to kind of, of take those take to take that away from people. We no mm-hmm. longer a lot of times we no longer need to do that, but um I, I think once you realize that a lot of times society doesn't always serve your best interest, you recognize that you have to fill in those gaps. Gone off of the um, the kind of obvious, uh, more basic approach to conversing about sales, which we can go back to. I mean, I I think um, we live in a, a society, you know, I'll say here in America, or at least where you know, in our region, if not the world. I mean, we're close to the metropolitan area here, which is a hustling, bustling sales marketplace, so to speak, but it probably goes and spans far beyond this, but I'll just speak to where we are. Um, you know, I, I just see it everywhere. I see it, you know, we talked about being pervasive before, like, it's becoming, like, actual, real, um, literal sales is becoming a part of, I think, almost every industry, you, a very, like, conscious level, or just blatant level, maybe, yeah, I think people are tapping into tapping into the idea that that you can essentially manipulate people to to your best interest. And I think instead of instead of it being that we're going to provide a product of value, a lot of a lot of times people are more so gravitating towards let's just put something out there. It doesn't matter what it is. It's yeah. kind of a piece of shit for all, yeah. for all that matter, for all they care. Unfortunately, that process works to a certain extent. Like, there's volume sales. Because, because people aren't aware of, of the underlying fundamental um, 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 uh, forces that are within them. And you, you, you liken it to emotion, which is true. It's like a, it's a behavioral pattern that we are falling victim to at times. And sometimes, honestly, just uh, falling victim to decision fatigue. It's like when you get offered enough things in a row that you're like, I'm just going to pick something so it stops. It's like speaking to influence and manipulation. That's another tactic, by the way, that that, that stores use. Like, they'll, they'll just, and, and um, that's why they, they structure their shelves in a way that is that causes that. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, and I mean, it's really everywhere when you look at the site. And people are probably trying to, uh, to check out without buying this at, at a certain point because it's like when you start to look for it, you, you can see it anywhere and everywhere. Um, other than, I think, um, in nature. I think this is honestly like one of the things nowadays to, to tie in another you know, concept here that, well, it'll tie in our world, but to get to another concept here that I think is just, it's just significant and impactful on so many people. Like, people are having serious issues with stress and anxiety and you know, decision fatigue is a real, like, issue for a lot of people. I know I've experienced that myself, of it leading to emotional and, you know, kind of mental strain. Definitely. Detrimentally so. Um, and a lot of this, like, sales world, like, it... It, it, it capitalizes on it. Yeah, and it has an effect on people. Like, I'll use myself as an example. Like, sales has screwed up my uh, psyche in a lot of ways you know, portions of time, and that's, it is what it is, like, there are costs and benefits to everything, but it's such a, it's such an overwhelming, and like you said, per- pervasive thing in our society nowadays, like, to go back to what I was about to go on to before with nature, it's like, sometimes getting out of just anything man-made just takes, gives you that relief of sometimes a solace that can't be found in the structures and the environments we create for ourselves because there's so much overwhelming, you know, content out there nowadays with social media, with any kind of media. Yeah, there's, there was... Even um, like you put in the grocery store, like it's situational, there's, environmental. It's, it's been phrased in a way that, um, the way that I've, I've heard it phrased is, is the war on sense making. Mm-hmm. Like, we're, we're... There's a lot of, there's very low signal, but there's a lot of noise. So, like, I don't know if you're familiar with radio frequencies, but, like, 
it's 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 all a month it's all a bunch of noise but like what happens with radio frequencies that we can actually listen to is that they're they're fine tuned in a way that there's a signal there that you can tap into and there's a lot of noise but mm-hmm. there's very low signal so a lot of it is just uh, there's, there's there's very little of it that's actually valuable and there's a lot of it that's just like Nonsense, basically. Exactly, just nonsense. You can't do anything with it. You can't use it, and and it's a tax on your mental resources mm-hmm. and your perceptual filters. You have to be able, so to combat one of the things you, you mentioned that decision fatigue. You have to have a system of of filtering stuff out. You have to um, you have to reliably have a system that's reliable, well, to the best degree that you can, enough to to discern what what is valuable information and what's just noise. You have to be able to discern the signal from the noise mm-hmm. and, and, be, and have a system for making sense of the world and making sense of whatever for um, yeah. sales, for example, example is, a, is a good, is a good, is a good tie in here. It's like in that realm of sales, mm-hmm. are you the person providing something of value or are you just making noise? Well said. I think it's a good time to wrap up with us. Having made noise for a little while now, I'm actually feeling a drain on my mental faculties. So maybe some rest and sustenance is in the works. But, uh, sustenance is always in the works. 